Hi, I'm Liz Pettit. In this session, we're going to discuss moving beyond flashcards for high-frequency word instruction. In fact, I want you to be able to use phonemic awareness to encourage the orthographic mapping process in your classroom for high-frequency word instruction that will bring automaticity in both reading and spelling. So first, let's discuss what's the difference between a sight word and a high-frequency word. Often, these two terms are used interchangeably. Are they exactly the same thing? Let's find out. Consider these words. Do you think they're sight words or high-frequency words? If you said both, you would be correct. First, let's talk about why they're high-frequency words. High-frequency words are exactly what they sound like. They're words that are frequent in the English language. They're used frequently, so we need our students to know them because they're going to see them again and again and again. And often, high-frequency words are phonetically irregular, like the word the or the word of. They don't sound like they're spelled. That's what I mean by phonetically irregular. High-frequency words don't have to be phonetically irregular, but often they are because they've been used so much over time that the pronunciation has changed. High-frequency words can also be phonetically regular, like the word if, or the word cat, or man. Now let's talk about sight words. These words, I'm willing to bet, are sight words for you, because you were able to read them instantaneously without thinking. They went by pretty fast, and I'm sure you read each one of them without having to stop and sound them out. That's because they're mapped to your brain through a process known by cognitive scientists as orthographic mapping. When a word is orthographically mapped to your brain, you know it so well that you read it instantly without thinking about it. What we want our students to do is use that process of orthographic mapping so that their high frequency words become sight words. They know them by sight instantaneously. They can invoke it. They can focus on the important part which is the comprehension of the text. If you haven't seen this podcast or listened to this podcast, I highly recommend it. Emily Hanford is an educational reporter, and she's been working hard at uncovering the truth of the science of reading. In this podcast, At a Loss for Words, the clip we're just going to play a short clip. And in the clip that we're going to listen to, they're really discussing how do students learn to read? Do they re learn to read by context, by whole word, or by letter sound relationship? In the real experiment, college students were trained and tested four times over four days. The students who were taught whole word did better than the phonics students at first. They were able to memorize some of the words and do better on the tests. But by day four, the students who learned in the phonics condition were doing better. Not only were they better at reading the words they'd been taught, they were better at reading words they'd never seen before. The big news of the experiment came when DJ and his colleagues got a peek inside the brains of their subjects using functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. We wanted to kind of get an inside glimpse of what these brains would look like in these two different learning methods. And I was expecting that those with holistic learning method would look almost like your run-of-the-mill dyslexic, in that many children with dyslexia learn to memorize lots of whole words, but they actually don't tend to activate the areas of the brain that are associated with phonology and pronunciation. And this is exactly what he found. His experiment and other studies show that people who are taught phonics learn better because focusing on letters and sounds increases activity in the area of the brain that is best wired for reading. So if you teach people through whole word method, you're teaching them to read like a dyslexic reads. That is correct. However, just because a student is taught to read with the whole word method doesn't mean he'll end up stuck reading words that way. In DJ's study, about half the students in the whole word group were able to get beyond memorizing words. They figured out the relationships between the sounds and the letters. But half the students in the whole word group weren't able to teach themselves to read. That's in contrast to the phonics group, where everyone learned to read.
Phonics worked for everybody, for all of the participants in the phonics group. They were uniformly doing well. What does all of this have to do with the idea of using context to read? After all, in DJ's study, the students were reading isolated words. Wouldn't putting those words in the context of a sentence help? Well, think about it. If you're a beginning reader and you don't know any of the words in a sentence, context isn't going to help you much. If you already know how to read a lot of words, it's a different story. Even expert readers need context in some cases. Take a word like match. We can't even know what match means unless it's in context, because it can mean a competition, it could mean something you, you light a fire with, you know, it could mean two things that look alike or, or the same. This is David Kilpatrick. He's a psychology professor at SUNY Cortland in upstate New York, and the author of a book about preventing reading difficulties. We need context for comprehension, for understanding. Nobody questions that. But the confusion is that when you see the word match, the word match jumps out at you. You don't need context to figure out that that's the word match. You need context to figure out the meaning. If you're a skilled reader, you know the word match instantly, whether that word is by itself or in a sentence. In fact, your brain has gotten so good at reading words that you process the word match faster than you process a picture of a match. You know tens of thousands of words instantly, on sight. How did you learn to do that? It happens through a process called orthographic mapping. Orthographic mapping occurs when you attend to the letters in a written word and link the word's pronunciation with its sequence of letters. Orthographic mapping requires an awareness of the speech sounds in words and an understanding of how those sounds are represented by letters. In other words, you gotta have phonics skills. Here's David Kilpatrick. It's really sequential. First, you develop a mastery of the code, and then that allows you to become better at the orthographic mapping process. So once you are good at phonics, you teach yourself new words that get anchored in your long-term memory. By the time a typically developing reader gets to about second grade, he needs just a few exposures to a word through both its pronunciation and its spelling. And bam, the word is orthographically mapped to his memory. He doesn't recognize that word because he's memorized it as a visual image. He recognizes it because at some point he successfully sounded it out. The more words he maps to his memory like this, the more he can focus on the meaning of what he's reading. He's not using his brain power to identify words. He's using his brain power to comprehend what he's reading. That child is a skilled reader. What? Now that we know that readers don't store words as visual images in the brain, let's take a look at Scarborough's rope to see the many strands that are woven into skilled readers. Skilled readers orthographically map by using different strands of this rope to imprint those words into their long-term memory. And not only to do that, but to remember those word parts to apply that new words that they're learning for the first time. So first of all, let's look at this Scarborough's rope. There's two main components to a reader. We have the language comprehension woven into the word recognition piece. So yes, our students need to recognize words, but they also need to understand what they're reading. And those things can't be pulled apart. To be a skilled reader, you have to have both. And what's interesting to orthographically map, those things are also wo woven together. In fact, students need their vocabulary linked to the decoding piece, the spelling, spelling town correspondence, linked to the phonemic awareness. It takes all three of those components to be a successful decoder or to have a word orthographically mapped to your brain for future use of autom with automaticity. The human memory is limited to about 2,000 individual symbols. You heard in the video that an average reader has tens of thousands of words mapped to their brain, way more than 2,000. We don't want our students to rely on their visual memory in order to be read their high frequency words or other words they come in contact with. So let's take a look at the pyramid of orthographic mapping. Let's look at the word bat. Going back to 
Scarborough's rope, we always want to start with the meaning of the word. If the student doesn't have anything to attach it to, we're not going to move forward. So we really want to dig deep into the meaning. That's why vocabularies with foundational skills in our teeth. It's part of that foundational skills knowledge. Often we think of vocabulary as part of our comprehension piece, but it comes before that. Kids are not going to be able to decode and read and store words automat for automaticity without the vocabulary, the meaning, the background knowledge. That's why it's so important we're reading aloud to kids, we're developing oral language skills, and we are making sure that the, we're adding vocabulary knowledge to our students daily. So once they know the semantics of the word, for the meaning, then we can go into the phonology, the sounds of the word. The word bat has three sounds or phonemes. A phoneme is an individual sound in a word. B, A, bat has three phonemes. Then we can link it to the orthography. The orthography is going to be the spelling pattern. A grapheme is a single, uh, the text that matches a single sound. So the, the word bat has three graphemes, B, A, T are the three graphemes for bat. So to orthographically map a word, the students need three things, the meaning, the sound, and the letters. They match those things together and it's part of the orthographic mapping process. So let's take a look at what this would look like in the classroom. How can you present this? You can encourage the process of orthographic mapping by putting those three components together, the meaning, the sound, and the letters. So we always want to start with that vocabulary. The word is hat. We're going to start with a phonetically regular word. We're going to start with a very easy word to map, hat. The teacher would say hat, and the student would know what that was. Then we're ready to hear all the individual sounds. So you wanna encourage your students to segment the word into sound. And I like to have them tap it. Ah. Then they're ready to put down a sound. For each phoneme, a dot. Ah. Three phonemes or sounds in the word hat. Then they're ready to graph the word or put the grapheme, the letter correspondence. Ah. So you can see that they have now completed the entire pyramid of orthographic mapping. The meaning, the teacher made sure that the student knew what the word meant and then move to the sounds or the phonemes, link it to the letter corresponding or the graph, the word. So now let's look at a phonetically irregular word. These ones can be a little bit more challenging, but it's the same process. We start with the meaning, move into the sound, and then match the letters. The word is friend. The student understands the word, the meaning, the context. So now we're ready to segment the word. Er, eh, n, d. Move one circle for each sound. And you can skip this part if you want and just have them tap it on their fingers. But I really like to use the pen frame for math because it's the same kind of manipulative that you already have laying around your class. So let's map the word friend. Er, eh, n, d. The word friend has five sounds. Now we're ready for the grapheme or the spelling link. Er, eh, n, d. So the good news about friend that we often overlook when we're teaching students to read words by sight is how much of the word is, is already phonetically regular. The FR at the beginning of the word is phonetically regular. They can sound that out. The ND is phonetically regular. They can sound that out. The only part that's tricky on this word is the IE. That E sound in friend is made by an IE. Notice that I wrote the, that part in 
red, you can have your students choose their own color to mark that word or circle it or put something around it. A lot of times um, people like to call them heart words. Really great reading uses that terminology. They have heart words and they put a heart around the part you need to know by heart. And essentially what we're doing is just giving them a multi-sensory trick to remember the part that can be tricky. The rest of the word is phonetically regular. They don't need to remember the whole word by sight. They just need a clue of which part is phonetically irregular to help them remember. An average student only needs one to four exposures before a word is mapped to their brain. And the great news about orthographic mapping is once they map word parts, like in the word hat, they might get come to a word like map they haven't seen before, but their brain already knows that app sound and will transfer the pattern. And that's part of why it's so important to use this orthographic mapping process. Instead of trying to remember all the words individually, we're really giving them to tools to read more words. Anytime you have more than one letter that combines to make a sound, like in this word friend, notice it's in the same box. If we had a digraph like the S H sound and we were doing the word sip, the S H would go in one box together. If you would only need three boxes for the word ship because it only has three sounds. If you were doing a blend like friend, or you split it up. The only time that letters share, share one box is if it's a digraph, a trigraph, or a vowel team of some sort. Okay, let's map some multisyllabic words. So we're gonna get a little bit more challenging here. What do we do with our third graders? What do we do with second graders at the end of the year? What do we do with struggling readers in fourth and fifth grade? How do we bring attention to this in multisyllabic words? It's pretty easy to do with words like for and said and the. Let's try to apply this to multisyllabic words. The only difference that I made was to break the word into syllables. So then you're putting it into a manageable part. Other than that, the process is the same. So the word is believe. This is where we're really going to stretch their vocabulary knowledge, talk about it in context of their own personal experiences, in context of text you're reading aloud to them, in context of text they are reading to themselves, Really use your oral language skills to discuss this word and dig deep into the meaning. Make sure you're doing the meaning in context so that they know the word inside and out. That's the first step of this process. And we're breaking the word into syllables. I almost forgot that part. Believe, be, leave, two syllables. And a lot of teachers like to do clapping or arm taps to teach syllables, to break words into syllables. But really what we know about words is, or our, our speech is that a syllable has a vowel sound. That's what makes it a syllable. And vowel sounds make us open our mouth. So when we are making a vowel sound or a new syllable, our mouth opens wider. So a trick for kids who are doing this when you're doing and they have no clue how many syllables are in a word. They're just kind of clapping and tapping at their own um, leisure. You can have them put their hand under their chin. And they can actually feel their chin drop every time their mouth says a vowel sound. So try it with believe. Believe. Notice my chin drops two times. Then they know how many syllables are in the word. When they're done counting the syllables, then they're going to do each part by syllable. So they'll tap just the first syllable in belief, the B. Notice I kept my B really crisp. I didn't add a schwa sound like B. I kept it really crisp. The E. The E. Break that syllable. Second part is leave. U. E. V. Believe. Once they have it broken, they've sounded out all the sounds, they know what sounds they're doing, then they're ready to link those letters. 
first syllable, B, B, E. And this is where you really want to draw attention to the syllable type. And if your students know their syllable type, this is going to help them with their reading. It's going to help them with their spelling. This is an open syllable. It ends with an E, B. Next syllable, leave, O, E, M. Missing an E. Notice what I'm going to do for that silent E. I'm keeping it in the same box. It doesn't make its own sound, so it can't have its own box. Keep, it's going to stay in the box with a V. The reason that that E is there in English, we don't end words with V. So if a word ends with a V, we put a silent E at the end just to hold its place. Because it's not phonetic, it's only there for the letter V, we're going to put it in the same box, just a little smaller. You can put it in a different color to help them remember. So you really want to teach them that spelling pattern that English words don't end in V. So we know we have to put an E at the end. That one's pretty easy for kids to remember once you teach it that way. So the only tricky part of this word is, again, the IE. So this is a vowel team syllable, has a vowel team, two or more vowels that make the vowel sound in the word, and it says the E sound. So the word is believe, and that's how I would teach that word. Finally, we're going to look at mapping with vocabulary and adding the morphological elements of the language. So we're still in strand one. We want to look at all the parts of vocabulary, the parts of meaning. When we get to third, fourth, and fifth grade, that's our focus. We want to focus on morphology, what's the meaning of the language, and build that into this phonic time for more advanced students. So we're starting with that meaning and context again. We'll break the word into syllables. And then we'll hear all the sounds in the word, the letters, and then we'll just take a look at the morphology. It's not really part of the orthographic mapping process, but I do think that it's important to bring it in. It's just a nice fit with what we're doing anyway. So let's look at the word. It's unreliable. So students will have all kinds of experiences. Use that oral language. It's so important. Talk about the word bring it back into context of their lives, books that you've read, do some read-alouds that can help with the word that you're teaching, and then you're ready to go. Break the word into syllables. Again, I would use this trick, unreliable, the long one. Let's hear all the sounds. The first part is un, a, uh, n, mm. break the syllable, re, er, e, break the syllable, Lie, o, I, break the syllable. Uh, break the syllable. Bull, b, o. Look at all those sounds in that word unreliable. It's a mouthful, but breaking it down like this is really going to help your students process the word. And doing this one time, even for students on level students at third, fourth, fifth grade is enough for them to make meaning of it. Remember, most readers only need one to four exposures with a word. You're doing vocabulary development, and then you're doing this as an activity in small group, then, or you could even do it whole group if you want. That is going to go a long way, this one activity, for them remembering this word. So now that we broke it into sounds, we're ready to attach those graphemes or the letters. Un, a. Uh, N, mm. re, er, e, lie, o, i. And on this one, hopefully you've done some work on changing y to an i, and you can talk about how unreliable that's part of it. And that kind of goes into the morphological element too, that we know that the base word here is rely. But if we're adding that ending, then we need to make it an I. So that's a conversation that you have with your students. And depending on where they are with that, this could be a colored piece or not, depending on where your students are. And honestly, with my kids, what I do is if they are having a hard time with it, then I have them color it a color because not all students are going to struggle with the same sounds in a word. So if you do have a student that's struggling with this I and unreliable, 
have them make it blue, green, purple, pink, and they'll remember. Then, uh, because it's that schwa sound, I did make it red, but if we're really looking at the morphology, then they're going to remember that it's an A. Bull, B, O. Notice I put the E the same size because on an unreliable, so our, um, our consonant LE syllable type, that's this one, consonant LE. We always break the syllable right before the consonant, and then the LE. The E is really there so that it's a syllable. So we need a vowel and a syllable. Bull. So the LE makes one sound together. So we have the word unreliable map. After you have it mapped, during the mapping, after the mapping, however you're comfortable with doing it, you just want to bring it the morphological elements of the word. So what you can do is if they write this in pencil, they can go back with color pencil and color it to show the morphology. So we have un as our prefix, and you can really talk about the meaning with that. And it's a great time to talk about what other word could we could cover this up and what else could we put here with this prefix. So un and then we're finding our base word is rely, and then the able. And this is where that's going to help with that spelling is bringing it back to the morphology because they know able is capable and linking it back that way. And what's really great about this is that they're going to really remember this, the morphology with the mapping. And when they go out and read and spell, they'll bring that with them, that knowledge. It's a really good way to cement that learning for them. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that this is going to help you with the orthographic mapping process.